You're listening to the Diplomats Podcast on Asian geopolitics. As always, I'm your host, Ankit Panda, recording from Washington, D.C. And I'm your co-host, Katie Putz, also recording from Washington, D.C. Good to be back with you, Katie. Hard to believe that 2021 is coming to a close. Uh, how, are you fe- how are you feeling about everything? You know, it's it's been a year. I, I, I think it's been a crazy year. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we're going to do something today, I guess, that we've done a few times before on the podcast, which is really just reflect on on the year gone by and uh, some of the significant uh, trends and developments that are likely to shape Asian geopolitics, not only in the year that has passed, but potentially next year and for a long time to come. And so in preparing for this, uh, Katie and I each came up with a list of five things that we thought mattered quite a bit this year. And unsurprisingly, we had quite a bit of overlap. So we actually basically ended up with a list of six things total to talk about because we basically agreed on four of the developments. Um, And uh, we had one each that wasn't on the other's list. Um, So I'm not going to spoil the list, but, you know, just to keep people listening, I guess. Uh, But we will go through things, you know, one at a time. Uh, I mean, Katie, is it fair to say that there's not really an order of primacy here? I mean, all of these things were important, but probably, you know, we are going to start with the one that I think was really the overriding shaper of a lot of geopolitical dynamics uh, in Asia and the world this year, which is unsurprisingly the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, And as we're recording this, uh, the Omicron variant is certainly raising concerns again, not just here in Washington, but around the world. uh, And it has in Asia, certainly. Um, So there's a lot to talk about with the pandemic. Um, But what was interesting to me, Katie, is that we sort of framed this yeah, uh, you know, we each had a different frame on this. You know, you came up with vaccine diplomacy. I talked a little bit about vaccine distribution in Asia. Both, I think, real issues that are certainly inter interrelated quite a bit. But, uh, but you know, why don't you kick us off? Uh, uh, talk a little bit about vaccine diplomacy this year uh, in the region. Uh, how did how did vaccine diplomacy and competition to distribute vaccines in a way um, contribute to uh, geopolitical dynamics in your view? So, I mean, I, I think I, I put this on my list. Um, because uh, you could not have talked about 2021 without talking about vaccines. Uh, and, and certainly when looking at it from a geopolitical lens, uh, the diplomacy surrounding vaccines is very interesting. I don't think it was as consequential as maybe people thought it would be earlier in the year. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that's because at the end of the day, countries will take what vaccines they can get their hands on. So it's, you know, the existential circumstances really override diplomatic signaling. So you see countries that maybe are not always super friendly with China. Vietnam's a good example, um, which is, you know, it's buying vaccines from the West, it's buying vaccines from Russia, it's buying vaccines from China. They're taking it from whoever they can get it from. And so I think it's an interesting instance in which the uh, geopolitical considerations get kind of put aside in some instances, not in all. Um, but that doesn't mean there isn't this, you know, all this talk about vaccine displo- diplomacy. And there's certainly a lot of criticism being thrown all over the place for the United States, for China. Uh, Russia was super slow with its rollout of, of um, producing vaccines. It had uh, come up with the very first vaccine uh, and, and was very proud of that and then wasn't able to ship it as fast as countries wanted anything. And mm-hmm. so I thought that was a particularly interesting facet. Um, when you were looking at at sort of the distribution of vaccines, what did you come up with? Um, so, you know, on, on the geopolitical side of things, uh, you know, one of the things that sort of stood out to me earlier in the year, uh, this was before the Delta wave uh, and, and really the Delta wave in India, uh, which was horrific in the middle of the year, uh, which was the the virtual quad leader summit. Uh, so the Biden administration uh, and um, the other quad countries, India, Japan, Australia, uh, have really been trying to hit home this idea that the quad is not an Asian NATO. It's not a security focused grouping. It's a consultative arrangement among like minded democracies. And so one of the banner findings of the Quad uh, after their first uh, leader level virtual summit this year was to lead with vaccine distribution. And that was obviously interesting in the context mm-hmm. of everything that China had been doing in the region. And actually, for listeners, uh, if you if you missed uh, this episode earlier in the year, uh, Sebastian Strangio and I uh, had quite a detailed conversation about the dynamics in vaccine distribution and vaccine geopolitics in Southeast Asia. So if you're interested in that issue, uh, certainly go back and revisit that because Sebastian had a lot of great details on how various countries were thinking about this issue. But Katie, you're absolutely right. I mean, with vaccines, there's really no basis to be choosy. I mean, you know, we are ending 2021 on a fairly, I mean, a remarkably impressive note, right? I mean, you know, by the end of 2020, we knew that vaccines had been developed, that they would be distributed. But if you'd asked me where we would be by the end of 2021, 
I mean, I think I would have probably had a more skeptical answer than our reality, which is that, you know, more than 2 billion vaccines have been, uh, or vaccine doses have been um, administered in Asia. Mm-hmm. Vaccines have enabled uh, limited travel bubbles to take take hold, although with Omicron, some of that has uh, gone backwards. But, you know, people-to-people ties, economic exchanges, business travel, in-person diplomacy, um, all of that has been able to resume. And I think that's had important effects. And then, you know, one more thing, Katie, is that there's a flip side to this, which is um, a lack of vaccine distribution. I mean, for instance, North Korea, which has, uh, you know, six million vaccines allocated by COVAX, has not begun to distribute any vaccines internally, remains entirely hermetically sealed off from the world in many ways, entirely unwilling to engage diplomatically. So I think uh, there's, um, again, I think a very important uh, geopolitical consequence of a lack of vaccine distribution. Um, I mean, you know, just forecasting a little bit into next year, I mean, uh, I think, you know, this is certainly going to be a continued topic of interest, especially as right now uh, with Omicron, it certainly seems like boosters are becoming a much more important component of the public health conversation worldwide. And inequity is becoming a much greater issue, uh, which is certainly Mm -hmm. weighing on many Asian states as well. So what are your thoughts on how how this is likely to develop uh, in 2022? I mean, I think you're absolutely right that the problem of uh, inequality is going to become increasingly clear you know states in the west are figuring out you know at what point should you get your your first booster and maybe there'll be future boosters um when there are a lot of countries in the world that that aren't even finished uh vaccinating a majority of their population um with with the first two necessary doses and so it's sort of i think that's going to become increasingly difficult and i think into 2022 we're going to continue to see these conversations about the intellectual property involved in vaccine manufacturing Mm -hmm. um and and you know should uh the modernas of the world share their their recipe with anyone who could possibly even make it um and in sort of what kind of implications that has for for the the biotech field and all of that. And I I think that's going to increasingly be a conversation because if we're going to continue to have to update COVID vaccines, um, you know, it's sort of at some point the the supply chain is going to get very exhausted. And so it'll be um, a bit interesting to watch into 2022. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, this is not a public health podcast, but I think it's uh, I think with Omicron, one of the things that's really interesting is that uh, in a, uh, the inactivated viral vector vaccines seem to be um, generally less effective than the mRNA vaccines. And so if that is going to be a longer term observation uh, and that seems to have very practical effects in containing the pandemic, I think this is this issue is only going to get uh, more serious in the coming year. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, certainly an issue to watch. Okay, so let's keep this going because we have a lot to cover and not a lot of time. Me too. Um, so, Kitty, I'm going to turn this around to you because this is one that we both, again, had on our list, which was, unsurprisingly, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, which we talked about uh, earlier this year. We talked about developments leading up to the withdrawal. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the significance uh, in, in your view. So the, you know... Um, while, well, I, I feel like there have been some recent news stories that suggest not everybody knew the withdrawal was going to happen when it did. Uh, we all knew very on uh, early in the year that there was going to be a U.S. withdrawal. The big question at the beginning of 2021 was, uh, is Biden going to pull that off by May, according to the original agreement? Um, and then he changed it to September 11th, which some people thought was maybe a little a little cringy of a date to pick. Uh, and then they said the end of August. And, and that's ultimately what happened. Now, a lot of other things happened in between, um, you know, particularly the spectacular and sudden collapse of the Afghan government on August 15th um, when Ashraf Ghani fled the country. But, you know, the implications for geopolitics, um, not just in South Asia and Central Asia, but for all of, all of Asia um, are pretty significant. You know, I think this is the takeover of Afghanistan by the Taliban um, Afghanistan now kind of exists in this like political limbo uh, in which, you know, there are no other governments in the world that recognize the Taliban government. Um, The Afghan seat at the UN is still occupied by uh, the ambassador appointed by the previous government. But there's this practical need to engage with the Taliban um, because there's a really horrific humanitarian disaster looming and, and occurring as we speak. And so I think that combined with the potential instability in Central and South Asia because of this, you know, the Taliban is in is in control nominally, but we don't really know that much about how practical that control is. And, you know, we've been seeing increasing um, I, uh, 
Islamic State Khorasan ISK attacks. And so there's this potential for a destabilization in the region that I think concerns a lot of countries. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you make of the, the withdrawal and sort of the implications for the region? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I think I think you've done a good job of talking about the internal uh, predicament for the Afghan people, certainly, which is horrific and playing out uh, as we speak. Um, I mean, regionally speaking, I think it's been uh, interesting to see the reaction from countries uh, like uh, India and Pakistan, both of whom have stakes, albeit in a very different way, uh, in, in the future of Afghanistan. I think for Pakistan, it's generally been a positive geopolitical development, although, you know, I think the ability of the Pakistanis to really... Uh, you know, quote unquote, control the Taliban uh, is certainly under doubt. I think there's a simplified narrative that, you know, the Taliban does Pakistan's bidding, which is a little overstated in my opinion. But certainly I think the Pakistanis took it as a win. Uh, India obviously regards this as a hugely negative development. Uh, 2020 was a very difficult year uh, along India's northern land border with China. Uh, tensions continue to persist with uh, along the land border with Pakistan. Um, and then Afghanistan, which is not so far away from India, uh, falling to the Taliban, I think, is, again, regarded as a very negative development along India's northern frontiers that uh, New Delhi is quite concerned about, especially uh, with the potential for um, al-Qaeda's South, uh, South Asian affiliate uh, to be able to operate more freely there. Um, China's reaction, I think, has been interesting because I think uh, China, for the longest time, had sort of free-rided uh, on, on the American um, presence in Afghanistan. Uh, China, I think, has long been concerned about Afghan soil potentially being used by certain groups that may not um, have the Communist Party's interests in mind, uh, to put it lightly. Uh, and so, but on the flip side, I think China has also been very much willing to do business with the Taliban. So, uh, you know, um, Wang Yi hosted a Taliban delegation uh, early last year. Um, they have been, I think, quite forward leaning since, uh, you know, without really, I think, charting a clear course about where they're going to go, much more willing. Uh, and I think same goes for the Russians. And then I'm not going to even pretend to talk about Central Asia, Katie, because that's totally <laughs> your area. So if you want to maybe briefly comment on on the Central Asian component here. So the, the Central Asian component is also pretty interesting. Um, I think Uzbekistan has led the way in terms of engaging with with the Taliban. Um, they had, uh, in the last several years, kicked up diplomatic efforts with with the Taliban, but always under the auspice of, um, you know, what we used to always talk about, the Afghan-led uh, peace peace process was was language that they used also. And so once the the Ghani government fell, they just continued that diplomacy. And I think it, it, it was an obviously a very practical decision to make. Um, they share a border with Afghanistan. They have concerns uh, about the possible use of Afghan soil for, for militant groups that may or may not want to destabilize them. Um, though I, I think some of those concerns are a little bit overblown, but it, it's hard to say. Uh, but th there has been kind of an interesting different reaction in Tajikistan, which has been more strident about not recognizing the Taliban, not working um, with them, but at the same time is not drifting too far from sort of the Russian-led position, which is, you know, Taliban just don't cause any problems for Central Asia. Central Asia is not going to cause any problems for you. Um, this is this is a a little bit of a of a pullback from the language that Central Asia was using previously, which you know Central Asianists were talking about. You know, how can we include Afghanistan in Central Asia? I don't know that that inclusive um, message is what's coming out anymore. But but there's certainly um, concerns uh, about Afghanistan and and a couple different. Um, tactics being taken with in, ter in terms of dealing with Afghanistan now. Um, but, you know, I think Central Asia is, is very closely following the Russian and Chinese line on this um, in terms of engagement, but not too much, uh, not too fast. Um, please don't cause us any problems is kind of the, the way to sum that up. Yeah. Um, so what, um, do you have anything else to add about Afghanistan? So going into 2022, what is it that you're sort of watching in this particular area? Um, I mean, really, I would say the humanitarian situation internally, uh, which honestly speaking, I'm not very optimistic about the potential for a positive response. Um, and the other issue uh, is, I mean, I think, again, tracking how various governments are dealing with the reality of the Taliban administering Afghanistan, which I think relates to the humanitarian issue. Um, and then finally, uh, on the American side, I mean, really looking at, you know, the the Biden administration, I think, following through on some of the commitments it made to Afghans who worked with the United States. I think uh, mm -hmm. that has, you know, people talk about credibility uh, consequences as a result of the Afghan withdrawal, which I think is a little bit overblown. But I certainly think, uh, you know, the United States has an obligation uh, to to make good on many of those commitments, you know, um, SIV visas and so forth, which um, I think the administration has not done a great job of. Uh, and certainly I think that was part of the you know, 
uh, the narrative that came out of the withdrawal was that, well, you know, maybe things weren't handled perfectly, but, you know, we'll, we'll make good on the commitments we had. So that's something that I think I'll be tracking uh, into the new year. Yeah, so same. I, I mean, I, I think the there's a real conundrum here in terms of how to help the Afghan people without necessarily helping the Taliban. And mm-hmm. it's it's unclear that you can do one without doing the other. Right. Um, and that, that's just a very cold way of looking at it. The obvious result is, is really tremendous human suffering. Um, but uh, speaking of other tremendous human suffering, the French, they got screwed. <laughs> can I say that? Um, let's move on to AUKUS. Uh, I want to ask you, you know, what what was the ultimate sort of beyond, I think, the dynamics of the Australia, UK, US, France relationship and its its occasional troubles? Um, what is what is what is the reality of, of the AUKUS decision for geopolitics in Asia? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, again, I mean, just to plug a few uh, a previous episode, uh, I had uh, Ashley Townshend from the United States Studies Center on the podcast to really talk in depth about AUKUS. But but very broadly, I mean, you know, AUKUS, everybody, everybody thinks about submarines when AUKUS comes up. And I mean, frankly speaking, you know, I'm going to hold my breath on the submarines. I mean, no pun intended. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, in terms of whether they manifest or not, we are in this 18th month period now where the details are supposed to be hammered out. But really what I think is significant about AUKUS is, first of all, the U.S. sending a very costly signal to an ally, Australia, about its willingness to be involved in the region for the long haul by sharing a technology, naval nuclear propulsion technology, which the U.S., doesn't have a history of sharing, frankly, uh, outside of the United Kingdom in the 1950s. Um, but apart from that, uh, I think it represents a an interesting approach to how the U.S. is contemplating Australia's role uh, in the Indo-Pacific going forward. There's obviously been a huge shift in the internal debate in Canberra and threat perceptions in Australia towards China over the last five years, represented also in the 2020 Defense Strategic Update in Asia. And so AUKUS uh, and the many many cooperative mechanisms involved, everything from, I think, AI, quantum computing, precision strike systems that we'll be sharing with Australia. All of that, I think, uh, contributes to a a pretty significant undertaking. Um, And then, you know, there is the proliferation component of this, which is that um, naval nuclear propulsion technology is not something that countries hand out lightly. In fact, with the exception, you know, Australia would become the first non-nuclear weapon state to operate a nuclear submarine that uses highly enriched uranium fuel, which is the only kind of naval nuclear fuel that the U.S. and the U.K. have on offer. The French, mm-hmm. incidentally, do have low enriched uranium fuel. Um, and that's actually going to generate, I think, incentives uh, elsewhere around the region to acquire this technology. Japan and South Korea have already expressed interest Um and, and in fact, uh, the French, who haven't been as willing to sell their low enriched uranium naval reactors in the past, I think after the AUKUS experience, may be a lot less inclined to uh, go ahead with some of those contracts potentially with South Korea. So that's something that I think uh, longer term is going to be interesting to watch. And then there's also sort of the wonkish, uh, you know, IAEA safeguards component of this that we don't have to get into because frankly, it's a, it's not so geopolitically relevant in the, in some ways. Um, but I think, I think AUKUS is, is going to be a pretty important development to follow. China certainly reacted negatively and sharply um, and uh, as has Russia. Uh, in fact, uh, Xi and Putin recently reaffirmed their opposition uh, to the arrangement. So I think this is going to be something to track uh, certainly next year. And I think it'll be um, quite prominent over Biden's term, at least. Uh, it's difficult to say whether AUKUS can or will survive in the form that it's been imagined in today uh, into future U.S. administrations. I think uh, you know mm-hmm. I, have, I have serious questions about the ability of the United States to do long-term statecraft given our domestic politics. But, uh, you know, all of that, I think, um, is perhaps a topic left for a podcast discussion in 2024. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's true. I, I, I just want to, even though you don't want to go into the, the long-term political uh, arrangements in the United States, I think that's a good point. You know, we, we talk a lot about AUKUS this year, but it was an agreement about something that takes a long time to actually implement. And so, you know, we're going to be talking about AUKUS for many years, and there's a lot of possible um, hiccups along the way, um, while the signaling value of it, I think, is still very relevant and very, um, obviously, it, it sort of is a tell what Australia is kind of thinking and worried about and, and what it thinks that it needs and who it thought that it could get it best from, um, I think, is worth keeping an eye on as we go into the new year. So let's keep going down our list. And the next one is something that I had, but you didn't have on your list, which was the discovery of new nuclear missile silos in China. (laughs) Yes, please tell me about those and why they're geopolitically relevant. So, okay. So this one, I'm going to try to be clear about this and try to choose my words carefully. So 
there's sort of two things that are interesting here, right? So obviously, it's not news to anyone that relations between the United States and China uh, are and have been poor now for several years, largely continue to remain poor. And I think for the long haul, China is continuing to expand its military capabilities and um, seeks to potentially pursue revisionist territorial objectives in Asia, not least in the South China Sea, East China Sea, but most significantly Taiwan. And so why are nuclear weapons relevant in this context? So China, I mean, going back to the days of Mao and China's first nuclear test in 1964, has largely found nuclear weapons to be somewhat uninteresting or, or at least mm. not very useful for pursuing military objectives. Um, to this end, China has retained a fairly lean nuclear force numbering in the mid 200s to potentially 300s of warheads, unlike the United States and Russia, uh, who maintained thousands of warheads. Um, maintain a policy of no first use. Um, and then lo and behold, in 2021, open source researchers uh, at three different institutions, the Federation of American Scientists, uh, the Center for uh, Nonproliferation Studies, uh, and uh, a third uh, organization that's not coming to me right now, um, discovered three separate silo fields, um, nuclear missile silo fields in China that are under construction. Um, mm. So I want to emphasize that we don't know what these are for because Xi Jinping uh, is not very transparent about nuclear batters. Uh, so Everything we know comes really from satellite images. Um, China probably doesn't have the missiles or the fissile material for nuclear warheads to actually fill these silos in the near term. But what's important is that what these silos represent, which I think is a shift in how China thinks about the role of nuclear weapons in its national defense strategy. Now, I'm not saying that China is going to become, co uh, you know, explore coercive uses of nuclear weapons or anything like that. But one of the things that is concerning, especially from the perspective of Taiwan, from U.S. allies in Asia is that by building a larger nuclear deterrent, China is effectively, you know, I, I tend to believe that the U.S. is already vulnerable to Chinese nuclear weapons, but by forcing a real, I think, reckoning in the United States with what this would mean for that mutual vulnerability relationship, China is effectively assuring that there will be a very high level of strategic stability with the United States. But that creates sort of the perverse incentive at the lower uh, at lower levels of conflict where you'd have instability. So you have the stability-instability paradox, which basically states that when you have high levels of nuclear stability, conventional instability can increase. And we've seen evidence of this um, in South Asia, for instance, where one year after nuclear tests in India and Pakistan, they fought a conventional war, uh, which didn't thankfully escalate to the nuclear level, uh, but, what, but you know, very well could have. And so the context of this in a Taiwan crisis is that because China would have a much larger capable nuclear force down the line, potentially by 2030, according to the China military power report that you and I just discussed, Katie, on a recent episode, you know, the U.S. thinks China will have potentially 700 to 1,000 warheads later this decade, uh, that in that scenario, a U.S. president might be then deterred from actually coming to Taiwan's aid because the prospect of certain nuclear retaliation would, I think, loom large. So I think this has significant consequences in in, in a number of ways. It's going to make uh, assurance, I think, quite difficult uh, in Asia for allies concerned about Chinese military capabilities. Um, and then the other thing, uh, reflecting a little bit about what we talked about after Biden's meeting with Xi Jinping, a uh, virtual meeting, uh, is to see whether in 2022 the U.S. and China can actually begin to talk about some of these issues, uh, which they haven't been able to do in recent years, uh, but something the Biden administration really wants to do. So, uh, you know, that's my short spiel about why this is geopolitically significant. We don't have to dwell on this, uh, but, you know, I, I do think this matters quite a bit. So um, I, I don't disagree that it should be included. I just don't know anything about missile silos. Well, you know, let's let's keep <laughs> now moving. I know more. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> let's let's keep let's keep rolling, though, because uh, the next one again, you know, we had we both had this on our list. And this goes back we to did. something that happened earlier in 2021, uh, certainly one of the biggest stories in Asia early in the year, uh, which was the coup d'etat in Myanmar. Uh, which um, resulted in the removal of the national unity government, uh, the imprisonment again of Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, control by the uh, by the Burmese military uh, certainly raised questions geopolitically about uh, whether Myanmar was uh, going to once again fall into China's sphere of influence in Asia. Um, but Katie, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, you know how you uh, saw this story evolve over the year. So I think the the February coup was both a surprise but also not necessarily shocking given sort of Myanmar's political history um, and it was a very clear sort of pulling back from this democratic um, progress that that we had seen since I guess it was 2011 um, really and, and more intensely in the last couple of years um, but I think you know in terms of geopolitics what was most surprising to me and, and worth commenting on was the ASEAN reaction 
um, and and you know the fact that the the coup leaders were not invited to leadership summit um, at ASEAN, which was a, which was a major question because I, th- I think you know uh, the the ASEAN sort of model um, is very open. There's a variety of kinds of states within ASEAN, other states that have had coups, in fact, um, and so it was a very interesting moment to watch that choice be made, um, and and I think the the implications of that we don't we don't fully. Um, we haven't fully seen the the that spool out. Um, when it comes to China, I am I am interested to hear your perspective on on did the Chinese reaction to the coup sort of meet up to expectations, or or did it you know has China sort of fallen in with the rest of the world and in, in waiting to see how long this lasts? Um, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, on, on, on you know on. To one end, I mean, I think China sees these kinds of developments, uh, you know, a coup in a country that bears geopolitical relevance for China, I think, for the Communist Party, at least uh, when it comes to declaratory language or, or public messaging. It's sort of akin to when an election result somewhere yields a bad result for, for Chinese interests, right? So it's, 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 a, it's an internal development that China will deal with, uh, which is what China publicly says. But I think on, on some level, I think geopolitically, they're you know, China could have very well kept working with the national unity government. I think it will in some ways benefit from um, the military retaining control over the long term. Um, I think certainly it's a negative development for the United States. So if we look at it sort of from a very simplified, you know, what's bad for the U.S. is good for China lens, uh, it's easy to come up with that narrative, which certainly I think was part of a lot of the conversation around this geopolitically early in the year. But really, I think, uh, you know, your emphasis about what this means for ASEAN, Southeast Asia more generally, I think, is, is is where our focus should be. I think going into 2022, I think there'll be questions about the extent to which I think just like the Taliban in Afghanistan, the military in Myanmar is able to normalize itself internationally. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, um, you know, China is going to be a big part of that uh, in, 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 in no small part. Uh, so uh, I'll be I'll be looking to uh, watch that again. And then, you know, not again to plug previous episodes, but um did a couple episodes with Sebastian Strangio both immediately after the coup and a few months later where we took stock of the developments that caused the coup and led into that. So if this is something that you find interesting and you want to revisit some of those, uh, definitely check out those episodes. Um, So Katie, final issue on our list, which was something that you had on your list that I did not, um, is the Glasgow COP26 climate conference. Uh, And you called it a flop. So tell us about this flop and, and why it's significant. So I, I, I think COP26 probably suffered from impossibly high expectations uh, in the sense that, you know, the the worsening medium to long term climate outlook for the earth is not good. And, and sort of what I think climate activists say is needed is dramatic, drastic actions now. And the world's governments, you know, kind of come together and go, we don't really have the political will to act dramatically. Um, the result of the conference, I think, was super interesting in that, you know, the final agreement, um, China and India together pushed to have language about phasing out the use of coal, watered down to phasing down coal. And I think that was a tremendous disappointment, certainly to um, countries in Asia that are absolutely on the, the front lines of the climate crisis. Um, incredibly disappointing to them, but also disappointing to, you know, countries like even the United States, which had agreed to the phase out of coal phrasing. Now, of course, this is just a document and this is just phrasing and it's not actually action. Um, but if your phrasing can't even be correct, how can we hope that there's going to be action? Um, and, and you know, I, I just I think it needed to be so much more impactful than it ended up being. And that's just really disappointing. Mm hmm. Yeah, just just one other note, uh, you know, and we talked about this on a recent episode again, uh, was the sort of surprise U.S.-China uh, joint statement on a climate that came out of COP26. The only reason I flag it is because I think, uh, you know, during the Trump administration, we sort of saw as, as U.S.-China relations became worse, uh, the old compartmentalization of global issues from the mm-hmm. bilateral relationship fall apart. And the ability, I think, to have that joint statement come out at COP26, I think, suggested um that, you know, the, uh, the dynamics within the Biden administration are pretty interesting about this with, you know, John Kerry leading the climate portfolio and being very determined to sort of seal off other issues from the relationship. But I think it's interesting to see, uh, you know, the the beginnings of potentially a slight restoration or a truce of that compartmentalization or, or you know, I mean, the, the cynical take is that it was opportunistic for the two powers to have that agreement to show something off to the rest of the world at the climate summit. Uh, but either way, I think it's a it's a notable development uh, that, you know, I'll be I'll be curious to track going into next year to see if 
uh, you know, U.S.-China dynamics continue to play out in those terms. Yeah, and, and I think that's absolutely right. And, I, and and if we had a seventh thing on 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 the list, then maybe that would be one. You know, can can the United States and China compartmentalize their relationship again and sort of make progress in some areas? Um, we'll have to see. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's actually a good note, Katie, for uh, you know, maybe to give our listeners a preview of the next issue of the magazine, uh, which is very much looking forward to next year. So, do you want to kind of tell people what to expect? Yes, absolutely. So the the January 2022 issue of the magazine, uh, the cover story is a, about a dozen writers looking at all of the regions that we, all the subregions and countries, most important countries that we cover in Asia, and sort of forecasting what to expect. Um, it's not really predictive. We're not saying expect these things. It's it's really a greatest hits list of things you should pay attention to. You know, what should you be watching in China? What should you be watching in Pakistan? What should you be watching in maritime Southeast Asia and and all the rest? And so it's I'm I've been working on it very hard and putting things together, and it's it's going to be a very good issue. Um, certainly, the the best thing you can read in early January to prepare yourself for what is going to be another exciting year in Asia. Yeah, and uh, and spoiler alerts, uh, I wrote one of the sections on what to expect with the United States. Uh, so uh, on that note, um, we're going to bring this episode, last episode of 2021, to a close. So Katie, thanks a lot. It was always super fun to do this and look forward to uh, doing many more of these in 2022. Absolutely. Thank you, Ankit. Yeah, and uh, to all of our listeners, uh, wherever you are, I hope uh, you remain safe and healthy and have a great end to 2021. Uh, Stay safe from Omicron uh, and stay safe from Delta, frankly, which continues to circulate as well. Uh, Here's hoping for a a better uh, 2022 uh, ahead. So uh, thanks again for listening, and we'll be back next year with more on the Asia Geopolitics Podcast. Thank you.